top 12. So, welcome back. It's great. <laughs> very, very happy to welcome um, Helen English Apple back to New York. Who's um, going to talk to us today about why there is no paradox of phenomenal confession? Okay, so I want to start off with a confession. Uh, and the confession is that I'm an epiphenomenalist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who know that I've got some idealist leanings, I actually think this is compatible with idealism that my, at least my non-perceptual mental states are causally efficacious. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, why I think one of the most pressing challenges for epiphenomenalism is in fact not a challenge at all. So um, when I tell people that I'm an epiphenomenalist, I tend to get a certain reaction that some of you guys have realized is this sort of like scorn, bewilderment, pity kind of reaction. Uh, but I think there are good reasons to be an epiphenomenalist. The reasons are you know, fairly obvious. I think there's good reasons to be a dualist, and I find causal closure sorts of problems really, really puzzling. Maybe some of you guys can explain to me why I shouldn't be so puzzled by this. Um, and I don't really think that there are any good reasons not to be an epiphenomenalist, probably much more contentiously. Um, so I think a lot of the reasons people think of phenomenalism is just transparently a terrible view. Um, I think really don't have much going for them. But there is a problem with epiphenomenalism that I think has not been satisfactorily addressed. Um, and that's the sort of challenge that I'm talking about today, what cluster of problems that Dave Chalmers um, refers to as the paradoxes of phenomenal judgment. Um, so the challenge roughly is a challenge for how it can be the case if epiphenomenalism is true, that we're able to have knowledge of our own phenomenal experiences. Um, and the claim is going to be, if I, my phenomenal experiences are causally inefficacious, then I can't actually know about them. Um, now, obviously, if this is the case, this is really bad news for phenomenalism because we can clearly know about our phenomenal experiences. We go on and on about them all the time, and phenomenalists like to say that dualists can't account for them, so we sure as heck better be able to know something about them. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that in fact there's not a problem here for epiphenomenalism. Rather, the problem arises when you try to combine epiphenomenalism about qualia with an incompatible sort of picture of subjects and their cognitive processes. So the sort of basic moral of the story is going to be, um, at least as I see it, that if you want to be an epiphenomenalist dualist, you need to embrace sort of the dualist friendly view of subjects of experience and the dualist friendly view about their cognitive processes. And once you do this, you will see that there is, in fact, no puzzle. The puzzle arises from combining these sort of incompatible bits of the mind. But that's not something that phenomenalists should be worried about. OK, so um, right, I'm going to take it you all know what phenomenalism is, but if anybody doesn't, there's my brain, um, this sort of physical thing. My physical brain does a bunch of stuff, causes me to have certain sorts of experiences, non-physical experiences. Those non-physical experiences are causally inert. They don't affect my, my brain, the physical world. They also, on the sort of view that I'm talking about, don't affect um, later mental states that I have. Okay, so here is the challenge laid out roughly following on Chalmers' presentation in Conscious Mind. So if epiphenomenalism is true, then I have a zombie twin in another possible world. Um, say I get hit by a mosquito, it itches, I'm like, ah, this is what itchiness feels like. I hate this experience. Um, my zombie twin has the very same things going on inside of her head as they're going on inside of my head. She makes the same sorts of vocalizations that I do at this point in time. So, it seems like my zombie twin has the same phenomenal judgments as me. Um, itchiness feels like this. And it seems like this judgment is formed by the same mechanism that my judgment was formed by. After all, my zombie twin has the same exact things going on inside of her head, the same mechanism at work as is going on in my head. But now, my zombie twin's judgment isn't just false, it's also not justified. Right? My zombie twin doesn't have any justification for thinking that itchiness feels like this. It doesn't really seem to even be thinking that itchiness feels like this. Um, so if my zombie twin's judgment isn't justified, and my judgment's formed by the same mechanism, it seems like my judgment isn't justified either. Um, so if epiphenomenalism is true, I'm not justified in thinking that itchiness feels like this, but clearly I am so justified, so epiphenomenalism can be right. Okay, I think I at least think this looks like a fairly bewildering challenge. Um, but I think that we can sort of 
restate what I take to really be at the heart of this in a way that should um, hopefully reveal that actually it's not so bewildering after all. So here's what I take to be sort of in the background of this, of this challenge. The idea seems to be something like this. Here's me, right? I'm this physical creature, and I've got a bunch of beliefs and other sorts of mental states. And then the epiphenomenalist comes and says, oh yeah, and then there's this qualia. The qualia is some non-physical thing, and it doesn't affect you at all. Okay, well if that's right, then how, how on earth am I supposed to know about the qualia? Right? The qualia doesn't affect me at all. How do I get sort of hooked up to it epistemically? Um, seems like you can't. Seems like it doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect my beliefs. So, you know, what, what good is it? What's it doing? Um, so we've got sort of a picture illustrating what I take to be the, the view on the handout. So we've got a um, circle of your brain, the activity, the starburst of brain activity, the um, verbalization, this is what the genus feels like. Um, and in the case of me, my brain activity is generating a conscious experience, the experience of itchiness. In the case of my zombie twin, there's no corresponding experience. Um, and um, you can see on the side where we've got me illustrated that um, the itchy sensation that I'm having doesn't, isn't affecting um, my brain, my um, judgment, my vocalization at any rate at all. Okay, so I think that this sort of picture um, really is not a sort of picture that an epiphenomenalist would ever want to embrace. So here's, here's what I take roughly to be the diagnosis of what's going wrong here. It seems like this paradox is implicitly assuming a physicalistic conception of beliefs and persons. Um, and I think really what the dualists should, should be thinking, how they should be thinking about beliefs and persons, is that my conscious experiences, they're essential to me. They're essentially a part of me. They're not something that stands at a distance from me, right? I am, at least in part, my experiences. My beliefs are, at least in part, composed of experiences. Um, and the thought is that it's a failure to acknowledge this, that's making it seem like these beliefs, these, these phenomenal experiences aren't affecting me in any way. But really, we should be locating me somewhere different on this map. Okay, so I've got um, also on your handout sort of a, a diagram of where I think the, the subject really ought to be located from the dualist's perspective here namely um, around the phenomenal experience. So you could have different sorts of views here. One sort of view could say that the subject is essentially simply um, a matter of a certain sorts of phenomenology, right? Phenomenology entirely constitutes the subject. You could also have a view where the phenomenology together with the underlying brain processes are both together constituting the subject. I guess you could also have a more robust view of subject where subject is some additional thing that somehow houses the phenomenology. I don't really understand that sort of view, but I guess not the whole bit. Um, but the thought is, the phenomenology is essentially part of the subject. Okay, so how does this help us in um, responding to the initial paradox? Um, so the thought is that this gives us a natural way of rejecting premise three. Um, so premise three involves two claims. So the first claim was that my zombie twin has the same phenomenal judgments as me. Um, after all, the same things are happening inside of her brain as are happening inside of my brain. Second claim was that her judgment is formed by the same mechanism as mine. After all, what's the mechanism? It's the brain. It's the stuff that's going on inside of the brain. Um, so it looks like we can reject both of these claims um, if we adopt the right sort of dualistic kind of picture of, of subjects and their beliefs. Um, and so the, in rejecting the first bit, I'm going to appeal to phenomenal concepts and uh, constitutional account of phenomenal concepts, but I don't think so we do that throughout this talk, but I don't actually think that's going to be essential. So I, I, I think that everything that um, David Pitt said in his talk, probably we could accommodate that and have my arguments still work. So I'll try to say something about that in a, in a bit. Um, but the thought is, um, on the first point, rejecting the idea that my zombie twin shares my phenomenal judgments, if my phenomenal judgments and me, myself, are both at least partially composed out of non-physical conscious experiences, and my zombie twin doesn't have any such experiences, my zombie twin does not share my phenomenal judgments. Um, this is similar, going to be similar to some stuff that Dave Chalmers says in um, his attempt to get out of paradox phenomenal judgment. Um, so we'll come back to how this could be the case, uh, how our, my judgments could be composed out of phenomenal experiences in a minute. Um, on the side of the mechanism, we also have a natural reason for thinking that um, you know, it's not the same mechanism at work for me and my zombie twin. So the mechanism that's responsible for my phenomenal experience of itchiness 
um, is not simply my brain doing what it's doing. Right? My zombie twin has the very same stuff happening in their brain. There's no phenomenal experience. Rather, the mechanism is something that, at least on my side, includes both the stuff that my brain is doing together with the bridging laws, right? those psychophysical bridging laws that are responsible for generating the experience of itchiness that I'm having. So if you look at sort of the to total mechanism, the total mechanism on my side includes an element, mainly these bridging laws, that my zombie twin does not include. Um, so we have different mechanisms at work in the two cases. Okay, so stepping back um, to talk about phenomenal judgments a second, and this is this is um, not super original, this is very much in line with um, stuff that Dave Chalmers says, and it's going to be sort of draws on um, some, some background stuff that Dave Chalmers and I guess Brie Gertner have also defended to do with the relationship between constitutional theories of phenomenal concepts and acquaintance. Um, why might we think, or how might phenomenal judgments be composed out of conscious experiences? Um, so a natural sort of thing that we could do here is to appeal to something like the constitutional theory of phenomenal concepts, which I very much like. Um, so as you guys have heard, this is sort of the view where my phenomenal experience is partially composed out of a token instance of the relevant type of experience that then um, facilitates to enable me to think about it and refer to it. So the phenomenal experience that I'm having serves as both a referent and a motive presentation for, um, for thoughts about that bit of phenomenology. I'm walking along, la la la, I stub my toe, oh, I think like, oh god, this is what pain feels like, I hate this experience. The thought is, what's happening is, I'm thinking, holding up an instance of, the, of, of pain, right, and I'm thinking, is what pain feels like. So, um, and I'm using that in order to think about what pain feels like. Um, kind of in the sort of same sort of way that you might, um, as in the example that I gave um, in comments earlier, I was sort of saying, you know, you might say, I'd really like to paint the room, and you might hold up a color patch. Um, the, same, the, idea is the same sort of thing can happen inside of your mind. You can take and you can use um, phenomenal experiences in order to be able to think about those very same phenomenal experiences. Okay, so if, if some sort of picture like that is right, then it seems like um, we can give a nice account of how it is that I can be justified in thinking that I have phenomenal experiences. Um, because these phenomenal experiences, they're right there, they're elements of my mind. I'm able to sort of use them in my thoughts. I'm not standing at a distance from the sort of the, the truth makers of my beliefs. The truth makers of my beliefs are actually right there as part of my mind, as part of the thoughts that I'm having when I'm forming these sorts of judgments. So that's the basic picture. Um, so um, my thought is constituted by the objects of my belief. I don't stand at a distance from my beliefs, truth maker, the nature of the objects of my belief the essence of itchiness, say, is directly presented to me as the means by which I think about itchiness. So, on the, in the case of me, we've got me with my phenomenal beliefs, right, because in order to have a phenomenal belief, I've got to have the development of phenomenology. We've got this awesome justification that's supposed to come from my being directly acquainted with the phenomenology. In the case of my zombie twin, we don't have either of these things. There's no phenomenal, there's no phenomenology, so there's no corresponding phenomenal belief. And um, there's also no awesome justification coming from acquaintance. So now, I think that this should be compatible with other sorts of ways of making sense of um, our acquaintance with phenomenology. Um, so I think um, in Andrew Pitt's talk, he said, um, acquaintance knowledge just is experience. Um, well, who has experiences? Conscious subjects have experiences, right? So it seems like there's going to, it doesn't seem like um, the conscious subject is going to be something that's going to be standing at a distance from the phenomenology. Um, even if we don't think that um, the thought is itself has embedded in it the phenomenology. So I'm not sure that I need this embedded phenomenology business. Okay, so that is the basic idea of how to respond to the paradox. But there is sort of a, a lingering worry. Um, so um, crucial step seems like it's missing from this defense, and this is something that um, uh, Bob Kirk has uh, written a lot about. So the worry is we need to have an explanation as to how it is that you can stand in the relevant epistemic relationship to your experiences such that they can, in fact, be constituents of your thought. So I'm able to, um, I stand in this special you know, direct acquaintancy relationship with my, with my experiences. I'm able to sort of know about them in this special justified way. I can't, um, I can't have thoughts that are partly composed out of your experiences, even if you Embrace something like a constitutional theory, I don't think you be acquainted with them in the right sort of way. Why is that? Um, 
And this might seem like a strange sort of thing to be asking, um, but Kirk is going to give some really cool examples to show that actually there is a lot more work that needs to be done. And so what I want to do is to try to do that work. So here's a quote from Kirk, not on your handout, unfortunately. Um, so Kirk asks, how in an e-world could physical processes of an individual body contribute to anyone's being in a relevant sort of epistemic contact with e -qualia? What could hook them up epistemically? I will argue that equalists cannot give a satisfactory answer to the question. The structure of an e-world would prevent its inhabitants from being in epistemic contact with their equalia, because the cognitive processing essential for the relevant sort of epistemic contact would have to be performed by physical processes epistemically insulated from equalia. So um, I guess the relevant bit is the cognitive processes essential for the relevant sort of epistemic contact would have to be performed by physical processes epistemically insulated from equality. Um, okay. Right, so as I said before, we're not just we're not acquainted with just any old epiphenomenal qualia, right? I'm acquainted with my qualia, I'm not acquainted with your qualia. If we had a zombie world and um, but, but we're all zombies, we introduce a bit of red qualia into the zombie world. The zombies don't thereby get epistemic access to the bit of red qualia. So why is it that I've got epistemic access to, to some qualia and not to other qualia? Well, Kirk has a, a nice suggestion to make for the, to the epiphenomenalist in responding to this. I think it's an obvious suggestion and one that um, would be very natural for an epiphenomenalist to embrace. Um, so to have epistemic contact with, with epiphenomenal qualia on this suggestion, the qualia must be caused by and isomorphic to the relevant physical processes. Okay, so um, the phenomenalist thinks that my qualia are caused by my brain, my qualia presumably may also think are, are isomorphic to the relevant brain processes, both those things look plausible, and if that's right, that gets us out of both of the um, sort of puzzle cases that were presented, right? Your qualia aren't caused by my brain, um, the red qualia introduced into the zombie world is caused by the zombie's brain. These things aren't isomorphic in the right sorts of ways. That's what's doing the work. Okay, the problem is, Kirk thinks, um, we can come up with examples of other epiphenomena that are both caused by my brain doing whatever it's doing and isomorphic to those brain processes, but where we're not thereby in epistemic contact with the epiphenomena. So it seems like if that's right, being caused by an isomorphic to brain processes is not enough to get you epistemic access to, um, to an epiphenomenon. So we need to have some sort of other explanation as to what's going on. Okay, so um, I'm going to call the, these, um, this example Kirk's currents, because it involves currents that Kirk comes up with. So imagine that in addition to producing qualia, our brain activity produces minute patterns of electrical activity which are in relevant respects isomorphic to them, but have no effects on them. So we never observe these currents, we don't come to know anything about them, they are in fact another epiphenomenon. Um, it is caused by my brain processes and isomorphic to them. Now, it seems like this is possible. It seems like there, you know, there's, surely there's some possible world where there are Kirk's currents, and we're not in epistemic contact with them. If that's right, then this criterion being caused by an isomorphic to my brain processes is not enough to explain how it is that I get epistemic access to something. So it's not going to help the other phenomenalist to get out of the original puzzle. So Kirk helpfully again um, offers three suggestions for how it is that an epiphenomenalist might um, get around this. Um, but he thinks that none of these suggestions is going to cut. So uh, here are the three suggestions. So first, Maybe there's something special about the intrinsic properties of my brain that's what accounts for the, the, for the difference. Well, that, that doesn't look at all compelling because the intrinsic properties of my brain are the same regardless of whether we're talking about my brain's connection to a phenomenal qualia or to Kirk's currents. Right? Um, okay, so knock that off. Second possibility is that there's something to do with the intrinsic properties of qualia. You know, maybe the intrinsic properties of qualia are different than the intrinsic properties of Kirk's currents. Um, so Kirk also thinks that this is not going to be a particularly good way of going. Um, as he says on your handout, the intrinsic properties could be whatever you please, provided they remain inert. I should still not be able to notice, think about, attend to, remember, or compare them. 
So, um, you know, you've got these things, they're epiphenomena, they don't come back and affect me um, in any way. So how are the intrinsic properties of these things that don't affect me uh, going to matter, right? It doesn't matter what they are, the intrinsic properties of them don't matter. What matters is how it is that they affect me and my cognitive processing. Something like that seems to be the idea. Um, hopefully you can see if my, by my, like, say, me, question mark, why it is that I don't like this particular thing. So the third option that EFP offers is, maybe there's something about the distinctive relationship between our brains and our qualia. Maybe my, the qualia stands in a distinctive relationship to my brain, that the Kurtz currents just doesn't stand into my brain. Um, okay, but then the challenge is, you know, maybe that's possible, but why, why can't it be the case that Kurtz currents stand in that same relationship? What's so special about this relationship that, that my brain stands into qualia that it can't be replicated in other cases where we don't thereby get epistemic access to that other phenomenon? Okay, now I think that Kirk is missing a natural alternative, right? So we've got this picture where he's sort of, he's considered the physical properties of the brain. He's considered the intrinsic properties of the qualia. He's considered the relationship between the qualia and the brain. But I think really what we should be interested in is the relationship between the qualia and the subject, not between the qualia and the brain. Um, so just to preview where I'm going to go with responding to this, um, first I'm going to argue that qualia stand in a distinctive relationship to subjects, not to our brains, um, given the right understanding of subjects from the dualist perspective. Um, then there's going to be this question, well, why is it that um, Kirk's currents can't stand in that same relationship to subjects? And the answer there is going to be something that's going to have to do with the intrinsic natures of uh, both qualia and subjects, and also the subjects' cognitive processes. But there's something uh, importantly different about the intrinsic natures of qualia that makes them particularly apt to stand in certain relationships to subjects and their cognitive processes, whereas there is no such reason to think that Kirk's currents, by virtue of their nature, have the same sort of aptness. Okay. Um, All right, so the basic idea is if epiphenomenal qualia are part of me, then I stand in a different relationship to my epiphenomenal qualia than I stand in to Kirk's currents. Um, so we've got another illustration on your handout of the relationship between my brain, my qualia, my Kirk's currents, and where I think we should be locating the subject in all of this mess, um, where things do not look so parallel as um, Kirk presents them as looking, I think. All right, so now, um, Kirk thinks that even if you individuate subjects so that um, their qualia are sort of essential to them, they're essentially part of them, um, this is not sufficient to answer his challenge. Um, and the reason he thinks has to do with the nature of cognitive processes, the relationship between cognitive processes and the phenomenal qualia. So he writes, even so, if qualia are epiphenomenal, they are epistemically insulated from all cognitive processes. No subject could think about, no his attempts to remember items in that stream of consciousness. No one could be in epistemic contact with them in the relevant sense. So I take it the idea here is regardless of how we individuate subjects, if qualia are, are, are um, causally inert, then they're not affecting, affecting my beliefs. And if qualia are causally inert, they're not affecting they're not causing me to notice things, right? They're not affecting my noticings. So it seems like they're cut off from my cognitive processes. They're not playing the right sort of role. Um, so it seems sort of like this, a parallel kind of thing is happening here as to what was happening before. So we're saying like, yeah, 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 maybe qualia are part of subjects, but they're cut off from the cognitive processes. Whereas before we were saying, yeah, 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 qualia, maybe they're not non-physical, but they're cut off thereby from subject. So I want to say, in both cases, um, there's no reason the epiphenomenalist has to say that these two things are cut off from one another. Um, okay, so, um, all right. So I think, you know, we started, we, Kirk himself offered this suggestion that, um, you know, epiphenomenal qualia need to be isomorphic to brain processes. And I think a natural extension of this for a variety of reasons would hold that, um, the, the, the neural underpinnings of my current beliefs, desires, and so on also have sort of phenomenal parallels, isomorphic phenomenal parallels. 
I think it's a very natural thing to say. And I think, you know, it's a particularly natural thing for, well, obviously for a dualist to say, it's a dualistic kind of view, but it's a particularly natural thing for a dualist to say um, because I think, you know, we have sort of access to the fact when I'm, when I'm desiring a cup of tea versus remembering a cup of tea, right? I have conscious access to that. So it seems like if I have some sort of conscious access to um, my believing versus desiring and to them being different from one another, it seems like there needs to be some sort of um, phenomenal analog of these things. Um, okay, so I want to say that just as before when I said that subjects, you know, on this sort of dualistic picture shouldn't be located as, you know, my brain doing what it's doing, I think cognitive processes also shouldn't be located as sort of purely physical things. They are, at least in part, phenomena. So we've got another illustration on your handout where I have sort of brain, uh, the neural correlates of, of belief, um, the neural correlates of your itchy sensation, um, and then we've got um, the resulting phenomenology um, of itchiness and the resulting um, sort of phenomenology of belief. Um, okay, so on this sort of uh, model, suppose that you know, my leg feels itchy. The itchiness that I feel um, when I when, when mosquito bites me. Um, is both part of me and also part of my cognitive processes. Um, so when I, you know, when I notice that I'm feeling itchy, um, maybe that noticing is caused by the fact that um, the mosquito has stung me, and as a result, my brain has done certain things. And as a result of that, my brain has generated a certain phenomenology, including the phenomenology of noticing. But really, um, at least a part of what's really relevant and essential here is that phenomenology of noticing. That's sort of essential for my noticing. So, yeah, we can talk more about that. Um, but on this picture, the relevant thing is the epiphenomenal qualia um, are constituents of subjects. The epiphenomenal qualia are also constituents of the subject's cognitive processes. And the cognitive processes are constituents of subjects. Right? So, it's not like we've got qualia and they're standing at a distance from either subjects or subjects' cognitive processes, right? Um, these things are, are very tightly, inextricably linked. So we don't have to have some sort of causal relationship between either the qualia and the subject, or the qualia and the, and the cognitive processes, because the cognitive processes and the subject are partially composed out of the phenomenology. <clears throat> okay, um, so maybe we don't get epistemic access to the brain processes underwriting the beliefs and underwriting the experiences, but that's not what we thought that we should be getting, right? We thought we should be getting epistemic access to the experiences themselves. Um, all right, so I've made sort of a bunch of assertions about how a dualist could think about things, um, and the idea that you know a dualist should be thinking about subjects in this way and should be thinking about cognitive processes in this way. But in a sense, it might seem like I've sort of not answered Kirk's challenge. So you might be asking yourself in particular, well, why can't subjects and their cognitive processes be partially constituted out of Kirk's currents in the same sort of way that they can be partially con constituted out of um, phenomenal qualia? Right? So there was supposed to be this disanalogy where Kirk said, you know, like, here, here are these Kirk's currents, we don't have epistemic contact to them. So I'm saying you can have epistemic contact with qualia. The whole entire puzzle was why did we get a, our epistemic contact with the qualia but not the Kirk's currents? Okay, so I think in order to answer this um, this challenge, why it is that qualia can be parts of subjects and their body processes but not Kirk's currents, um, we need to think about the intrinsic nature of qualia in relation to the intrinsic natures of subjects, what subjects fundamentally are, and what beliefs and other cognitive processes fundamentally are. So Qualia aren't just any old non-physical process, right? It's not just like you've got some sort of non-physical stuff, hey, it's qualia, right? It's a special kind of non-physical stuff from the dualist perspective. They're also not, from the epiphenomenalist perspective, just supposed to be just any old epiphenomenal stuff, right? Um, qualia seem by their natures to be the sorts of things that are um, suitable for constituting subjects. So um, here I'm going to sort of draw on like Rega, you know, Strawson. Um, it seems plausible that experiences are essentially experienced. Um, I, I, I think it's going to say that there should be an experience that has to be an experiencer. So here's, here's a quote, a couple of quotes from Frege. So Frege says, can there be a pain without there being someone who has it? 
being experienced is necessarily connected with pain, and someone experiencing is necessarily connected with being experienced. Um, the sense of oppression I have of green exists only because of me. I am its bearer. It seems absurd to us that a pain, a mood, a wish could grow without in the world without a bearer independently. An experience is impossible without an experience. The inner world presupposes a person whose inner world it is. Okay, so when I say that I like this sort of idea, I don't mean that I like the idea that there's a connection between experiences and experiencers in some like super metaphysically like robust sense of experiencer. I think that all we really need to get out of this is a super, super thin kind of experience, right? So when I say there's a con essential connection between qualia and the subject, the thought is the subject is just what you get by virtue of there being this qualia. Um, so there's red qualia, there's an experience of red qualia. Nothing more metaphysically grand than that. Um, so Strawson has a nice quote where he says something very much like this. He says, a subject of experience is not something grand, it is simply something that must exist whenever there is an experience simply because experience is necessarily experience for. Okay, so I think you could embrace a, a more metaphysically robust picture of subjects where they had some sort of essential connection to experiences. Um, but even without that, I think this gets us an important type of connection between qualia, our experiences, and subjects of experience. Um, and there's not any reason to think that there's such a connection between Kirk's currents, whatever they are, and subjects of experience. Um, okay, so that, that has to do with the relationship between qualia and subjects. What about the relationship between qualia and cognitive processes? Um, I think we can say something similar here. So, um, question, why can't qualia serve as constituents of our beliefs and other cognitive processes, whereas Kirk's friends can? Whereas Kirk's friends can't, sorry. Um, so, obviously not just any old thing is capable of serving as a constituent of my beliefs, right? Um, I can't sort of take a constitutional kind of account of, of, of you know, uh, phenomenal beliefs. Um, nobody thinks that I can just sort of use that chair in my mind as like a component of a concept. Uh, in the same literal sense that proponents of constitutional kind of theory think you can with an instance of pain. Um, so you might think, well, why is that? I stand in the right sort of epistemic relationship to my experiences. I don't stand in the right epistemic relationship to chairs. That can't be the answer, because the entire question that Kirk is pressing on here is, why do we stand in the right sort of epistemic relationship? So why do I think I can stand in the relevant epistemic relationship to equalia, but not to Kirk's currents? Um, here are what strike me as two plausible, um, plausible claims. So claim one, an item is eligible to serve as a constituent of the subject's belief if it, like the belief, is a mental part of the subject. Um, so when I, I sort of, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if I did this actually here, but when I sort of think about why it is that, um, you know, the constitutional theory looks appealing to a lot of people, the constitutional kind of account of, of um, experiences looks appealing, it's because <laughs> All I'm doing is I'm sort of taking something that's already in my mind and I'm using it as part of my belief, right? I've got these beliefs, the beliefs are parts of me, they're these mental things, <laughs> and then, you know, sort of in my mind in some metaphorical sense, I've also got these experiences and I'm able to sort of use the experience embedding it in the other bits of my mind. Um, so, a subject's qualia are elements of her mind, a subject's Kirk's currents are not elements of her mind. It doesn't seem like there's any more reason to think that I should be able to use a Kirk's current as part of my thought than there is that I should be able to use um, you know, the lecture as a part of my thought. Um, again, I, I suspect that we can translate this um, into, into non-constitutional concepts y talk and have the same thing from the economist's perspective on how we're getting. Um, okay, so um, Right, so it seems like there's, there's an important connection between qualia and, um, and beliefs, insofar as qualia seem to be um, particularly suited to being components of beliefs. Um, we can also sort of think about this from the other kind of perspective. So why I think that beliefs are particularly eligible to contain qualia? Um, here are two more things that strike me as plausible um, claims. So first, cognitive processes are all processes of a subject. Right? So there can't be a belief without there being someone who believes, or a noticing without there being someone who notices. Noticings aren't just like free-floating from subjects. Okay, um, second plausible seeming claim, beliefs are essentially representational. So in representing, they seem to represent to a subject. Now, 
the subject, remember, from the dualist perspective, is something that's sort of fundamentally, at least in part, mental. So how is it that something can represent to this subject of experience? Well, it seems like qualia, like experience, like phenomenology, is going to be, you know, something that's going to be particularly apt for presenting things to a conscious subject of experience. By contrast, I don't see any reason to think that Kirk's currents are particularly suited for presenting the world to a conscious phenomenon in the subject of experience. So if that's right, it looks like we, um, if, actually if either of these two things, claim one or claim two is right, it looks like we have a reason to think that there is a disconnect between, uh, the, between the relationships between other phenomenal qualia and cognitive processes and Kirk's currents and cognitive processes. Right? Um, in terms of, as a result of the intrinsic natures of the various components, one sort of thing, ethanol qualia, or just qualia in general, are apt to serve as constituents of subjects' cognitive processes, whereas there's no reason to think the corresponding thing is true for first currents. Okay, so um, in short, in answering, um, in answering this sort of further challenge um, beyond the original paradox of phenomenal judgments, um, what is necessary to have epistemic contact with my epiphenomenal qualia, in addition to them being caused by my somatic to my brain processes? Well, um, here's how the relationship between um, something like Kirk's currents and epiphenomenal qualia differs. First of all, Kirk's currents stand in a different relationship to <laughs> subjects of experience, given the correct dualistic understanding of subjects of experience, um, because Kirk's currents are not constituents of subjects and their cognitive processes. Okay, second question is, why is it that, um, you know, in the case of epiphenomenal qualia, they can serve as constituents, and in the case of Kirk's currents, they can't? Well, that has to do with the intrinsic nature of the various components involved. Okay, so um, I think really the sort of re response that I've given to Kirk is something that is very similar to the response that I think is the appropriate response to the original paradox. And in both of these cases, I think what winds up being problematic isn't epiphenomenalism per se, it's trying to fit epiphenomenalism into um, a picture of mind that's incompatible. With it. So I think the lesson that we should take away from this is that being an epiphenomenalist dualist commits you to more than just a story about qualia, it commits you to a story about the rest of the mind as well, about the nature of subjects and the nature of their cognitive processes. So thanks, that's it. Thank you very much for that. Now, keep, keep, everyone keep, keep their hands up. Let's start with...